Hey, good day, everybody. Welcome to the Indian Boxer Ring um, exclusive. Uh, our today is Dawn uh, D. Danner. Uh, Dawn D. Danner is uh, not a boxer breeder. Uh, she is uh, a successful Doberman breeder. And uh, this is not the Indian Doberman ring. It is still the Indian Boxer Ring. Uh, but Dawn is uh, a little bit of introduction about Dawn. Uh, she is a Doberman breeder, owner, and a handler. Uh, hailing from the Portland area uh, from the United States. Uh, she started her career with uh, dogs in 1987. Again, I'm not aging you here, Don. Uh, I have to give the facts for people to know about you. Uh, Don is also licensed by the American Kennel Club. Uh, she's approved to judge uh, numerous working groups, working breeds rather, uh, including boxers. Uh, professionally, Don is a certified uh, veterinary technician. Um, who manages a busy small animal practice in addition to her role with Alba Medical. Um, Alba Medical, as we all know, is uh, is uh, leading the way with promoting the life-saving halter uh, testing uh, to the fancy. Uh, she also uh, believes uh, that dogs should not only be uh, wonderful companions, uh, but they should also, uh, but as breeders, she feels that it's it's responsible and ethical practice uh, to improve long longevity um, in pedigrees by removing the affected individuals from the breeding programs. Um, knowledge uh, of health is uh, is the way that we should be progressing for the preservation and the protection of the breed. And with that context, I want to welcome Don uh, to the Indian Boxer Ring exclusive interview today. Don, how are you doing? this Sunday morning. I'm doing well. Thank you for inviting me to come and talk about um, what I, what is very passionate to me, and that's health testing, in particular, heart testing for breeds that have a very large prevalence of heart disease. Sure. Dobermans being one of them, boxers being um, another breed that Alba Medical works very closely with. Wonderful. And uh, I think for the ones that are tuned in today, I know this is, uh, uh, there, there's a lot of studies about heart testing, and I'm sure um, you would have had your hands uh, on uh, the heart testing and about holders. And I'm sure you have a lot of questions and perspectives uh, that you would like to learn from uh, Dawn. And that was the reason why we decided to invite Dawn to share her knowledge uh, about the heart testing with, with dogs. And Don is going to actually uh, make it specific to boxers because, as you know, uh, with different breeds lie different health challenges. But with specifically with boxers, the common um, uh, the common denominator here is the health, is the heart and health testing. Uh, so this session is going to be a two part uh, series, uh, or it's not going to be a two part series. I'm already inviting Don here. I hope she comes back again. But it's going to be a two part presentation. The first one is going to be a presentation about Dawn, where she's going to share knowledge about heart testing. And uh, once she is done with the presentation, uh, we're going to have a Q&A session uh, with Dawn. So that's how this program is, uh, or this session is going to be structured. Uh, so for starters, um, here's an opportunity for you to also observe and uh, take in as much knowledge as you can. And Don uh, will be taking your questions, so feel free to drop your comments, uh, your questions in the comment section, and I'll make sure that I ask Don those questions. So without any further ado, uh, Don, um, I'm going to hand this over to you for the presentation um, so that you can actually uh, share that. And, uh, and that is Don, your presentation is on the screen. So I'm going to actually disappear and I'm going to actually make my notes to ask you those questions. So Don, uh, you can you can actually go ahead. OK, great. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, I'm going to start with a presentation. I'm going to try to go through the slides slowly, covering everything that comes to mind to try to explain everything thoroughly to you. Um, please write down your questions and we're going to address everything at the end of the presentation. Um, all of the boxer pictures I borrowed from the American Boxer Club website. They had lovely pictures, and I have put them up to share them with you all today. 
So again, my name is Dawn D. Danner. I am a certified veterinary technician. I do represent Alba Medical and I have been working with Alba Medical very closely since 2009. A little bit about myself. I wanna make very clear to everybody that I am not a veterinarian. I am not a boarded cardiologist. I do work very closely with lots of different doctors and cardiologists throughout the area um, battling this disease. I have sold halter monitors to Dr. Michael O'Grady himself. If anybody's familiar with the early um, beginnings of haltering, Dr. Michael O'Grady was a researcher with the University of Guelph that started a very active rental program and he is retired from the University of Guelph. He's actually working in private practice now, still echoing and haltering, um, and he does use Alba Medical units. Um, I am an experienced Doberman breeder owner handler, and I purchased my first bitch in 1987 and had my first litter in, in 1991. I am a certified veterinary technician. I do manage a very busy small animal practice in Portland, Oregon. Um, and COVID has, expect, has affected us here just like everywhere around the world. And um, veterinary medicine has been crazy busy since COVID started. Um, I have been battling DCM on the front lines for the, at least the last 25 years. And I feel we are making a difference in the Northwest and we are making a difference around the world. Um, I joined vet, uh, Alba Medical's veterinary sales team in 2009. I am a member of the Darwin Pinter Club of America. I am the president of the local chapter club, Mount Hood Darwin Pinter Club. I'm an AKC judge. I am approved for numerous working breeds, including boxers. Um, I am the Holter Chair for Mount Hood and um, I have been chairing that project since it started. And the club also has biannual heart clinics. And at those heart clinics, we do echoes with a boarded cardiologist twice a year to help find dogs at the earliest stages and get them on medication. So the outline for today, um, we're gonna discuss what is heart failure versus heart disease. We're gonna go over the classification scheme that doctors use. We're gonna do some updates on genetic diseases, specifically uh, DCM and ARVC. We're gonna go over the halter units. We're gonna look at some reports and I'm gonna to touch on OFA's advanced cardiac database. That is uh, one of my dogs, Cross, and I um, at a booth at the National, one of the Doberman Nationals. So heart disease. Heart disease can be occult. Occult means hidden. So, you know, in, in medical terminology, we like to throw in things that people don't understand the definition. So I'm hoping that we can bring that to light so anytime you hear occult, it means it's hidden or concealed. And the only way you know about it is through advanced testing, such as an ultrasound or echo, or a 24 hour Holter report. Now ProBNP is a test, it's a blood test that you can run through your general veterinarian and that is around the world. IDEX is a worldwide reference lab that your general veterinarian uses to process blood samples. And ProBNP is a test that measures heart stretch. So in boxers, the, primarily, the primary disease you are dealing with is not dilation like in Doberman's, but it's important to understand that there is a blood test that we can do to um, evaluate heart stretch, and that's ProBNP. Heart disease can be overt, and that means it's visible to the naked eye. We know that dog has heart disease. We know that because the dog is fainting, or the dog is coughing, or it's, 
it's no longer hidden, it is known. So what is heart failure? So if a dog has heart disease, that does not mean the dog has heart failure. So you can think of the heart as a pump, as a muscle that pumps blood. And in, in the disease, in the process of heart failure, we have the inability of the heart or the muscle to work as a pump. And that pre decreases cardiac output. So we have impaired cardiac function. So myocardial dysfunctions such as DCM or dilated cardiomyopathy, such as R ARVC, which is arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. That is what we primarily see in boxers. We have HCM, which is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. That we see fairly regularly in cats. And hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the opposite of dilated cardiomyopathy. Hypertrophic is, okay, so let's back up. Dilated cardiomyopathy is where the heart dilates and becomes large. And the walls of the, of the heart become thin once they become thin to a, to a certain extent, once they become thin beyond a certain number, the heart is no longer able to work as a pump and is unable to push blood around the body. So in the case of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the walls become thickened. It gets to the point where they become so thickened that it decreases the diameter of the internal chambers of the heart. And all of a sudden, you don't have any space for the blood to pool to be pumped out. We see this very regularly in cats. And I will tell you that these cats, that senior cats that come in that are eating voraciously, we check blood work. Their thyroids or their oven, let's say, in their body is operating at four to five times what it should be. If those cats are not treated, those cats develop hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We also have arrhythmias. And this, this subject we can talk about later because what came first, the chicken or the egg? I honestly feel we need to do a better job at monitoring thyroid. And if we, le we let those thyroids go unchecked, leads to heart disease. Um, we have valvular dysfunctions where the valves don't open or close properly. And we have breeds that have problems. So MVD stands for mitral valve disease. And this is where we get a whistling or a murmur classic breed that has this problem, Cavaliers. We have TVD, which stands for tricuspid valvular disease. And this is where we have improperly formed valves during development. And we see this a lot in labs. We have impaired venous return, pericardial effusion, where I have another, we're gonna look at that in a little bit. All of this boils down to the pump or the heart, failure to fill or failure to pump. So we're just briefly gonna go over heart failure so you understand. So we have two forms of heart failure. We have left. This is where the heart dilates, ECM. How does that affect the rest of the body? So we get a decreased cardiac output, which then leads to atrial decrease in atrial pressure. There's a system in the kidney called RAS. We're not gonna go into that, but it increases RAS, which then affects sodium and water retention increases LA and LV pressures, 
left atrium, left ventricle, which affects pulmonary pressures. The end result is pulmonary edema, and that is where the patient is coughing. Or if you are, not or, but a good way to evaluate pulmonary edema is by learning to monitor uh, resting respiration rate. And that is where we count a dog's rise and fall of the chest over time. And owners with breeds that have DCM, they become very good at monitoring that. And if we have an increased resting respiration rate, that means we are having problems with fluid. And right heart failure, things are a little different. The, the fluid pulls in another cavity, basically. So we get pericard pericardial effusion. That is where we have a buildup of fluid around the heart. This affects the return of blood to the heart. We have, if we have a return that's impaired, we thus have an output that is impaired in addition to atrial pressure. Again, affects the RAS system in the kidneys, affects water and sodium retention, venous pressure, leads to hepatic congestion, and ascites is basically fluid pooling in the abdomen. So these dogs come into the clinic and they have a very pot-bellied appearance. They're not coughing because that pressure or that fluid is building up in their abdomen. So real quickly, classifications of heart failure. So at risk for heart failure, stage A, apparently healthy but high risk of developing heart disease. That unfortunately is Dobermans and Boxers. Um, why? Because both of these breeds have a prevalence of 50% or over of developing DCM. When we get to stage two, we have an asymptomatic animal, but minimal remodeling of the heart. So this is a dog that shows no signs. That's a cult, right? We all know what a cult is. Some minimal changes starting to occur in the heart. When we get to 2B, we are still a cult, but the changes are becoming more significant. So how would we see these stages? Um, for a boxer, it's going to be a halter. For a Doberman, it's going to be a halter and an echo. We get to heart failure. That is where we have the heart is no longer able to perform adequately as a pump. We get to stage C. We have past or current signs, symptoms of CHF, that's congestive heart failure. Stage D is end of life or end of, end of congestive heart failure where medications are no longer able to control um, what's going on with the heart. And this of course is a downward effect. Cardiologists use a classification system to stage patients. A is an annual auscultation, client education, plus or minus screening. So this is us going in with our dogs to a, card, to a general practitioner and they're listening to the heart. Listening to the heart is good, but for breeds that suffer from arrhythmia or dilation, I will tell you, you can listen to the heart with a stethoscope and it can sound normal, of course, you're only listening to a very small period of time, you know, maybe a minute, uh, maybe two minutes. So we're going to go, we're going to discuss in a bit why the halter is superior. Um, B. Again, we have B1 and B2. B1, we do an exam, we take a history, we may take x-rays. 
Um, again, this is more for breeds that have dilation issues. We're going to do education, plus or minus an echo, but no medications. This is what we're doing at those heart clinics that I'm running twice a year, um, where we are getting um, information about each patient's heart. There's so much information learned by an echo. Um, and I will emphasize that it should be done by a boarded cardiologist in your country. And ideally, I would like you going to the same cardiologist if you're doing serial echoes. And uh, the cardiologists have explained to me that each doctor can have their own little way of taking measurements. And I would like you to be able to compare measurements year to year from the same um, physician. 2B is where we have some remodeling and we're going to start medications. Now, depending on the breed we're working with um, and depending on the doctor, that is gonna decide at what point we are starting those medications. C is a dog in congestive heart failure. And I can tell that because we've added furosemide. Furosemide is a diuretic. It is what some people will call a water pill. It's used to control fluid. So hearts that are struggling, um, that are in heart failure, need furosemide to control that. Pimobendin is um, a medication made by BI, Bollinger Ingelheim. The uh, Bollinger Ingelheim has patented this medication. Pimobendin is the generic name. Uh, BI's branded name is called, it's Vetmedin, and it, it is an amazing drug, um, one of a kind, that bar none has significantly improved quality of life and extended life expectancy on four dogs that are, ha that are having heart failure, heart disease. Um, ACE inhibitor, ACE inhibitor is a product like uh, enalapril or benazapril. They're both the same, one's twice a day, one's once a day. Um, those products are what we call uh, vasodilators. They dilate the blood vessels and allow the heart to work easier because the, uh, the pipes are bigger and the heart can work less to produce, to get the blood to um, circulate. Plus or, plus or minus spare lactone. It's another heart medication. Now, another medication for boxers that might be in here is an antiarrhythmic, um, like maxillotine. And we'll go over the antiarrhythmics a little later. D is emphasis on quality of life. And here we are gonna start palliative therapies on a case-by-case -case basis to keep the patient comfortable. Emphasis here is on this stage of the disease. We, we want to prolong D as long as possible. So dilated cardiomyopathy, the etiology. So primarily it's a myocardial disease. It's genetic in many breeds, including Dobermans, Boxers, and Danes. What I wanna place emphasis on is that cardiomyopathy and breeds that have a prevalence of 50% or more, or close to 50%, sometimes you'll get researchers that will report a number in the US different from Europe. Reality is if it's close to 50%, we are dealing with a breed problem and not a line problem. And I cannot emphasize that enough. As breeders, we need to embrace that and realize that every breeder, we are all dealing with the same problem. And it, I always feel sad when we need to 
identify one dog or one line when in reality <laughs> the breed is a 50% rate we are dealing with the breed problem and if nothing else I want to get that message out and have people really think about that and we need to embrace preservation breeding and we need to embrace producing the next generation of dogs that is hopefully better than the first and we do that by assessing structure we do that by assessing temperament and we do that by assessing health and longevity needs to become a critical part of the equation we do have acquired cardiomyopathies we have uh, cardiomyopathies that are acquired by doxorub doxorubicin that is a chemotherapy agent uh, tachycardia induced tachycardia means a rapid heart rate so individuals that have tachycardia on a regular basis can cause damage to the heart nutritional deficiencies this has become a huge hot topic for years we've known a taurine deficiency in cats can cause hypertrophic cardiomyopathy we have seen recently huge statements released by the FDA on grain-free kibbles. It is amazing to me how many clients come into the practice that we ask, what are you feeding your dog? And over 50% of them are free feeding a grain-free kibble. Now, I'm not talking about the BARF diet. I'm not talking about feeding raw. We are talking about feeding a grain-free kibble kibble that has legumes in it instead of corn or instead of rice um, and that are being manufactured by companies that may or may not have nutritionists on staff. So most of the cardiologists have come out with pretty strong statements about grain-free kibble. Now I will tell you, and that's from the FDA, um, I had a cardiologist in Portland many, many moons ago who told me he did not recommend feeding a Doberman in particular lamb and rice diet. He felt, and this was way before we had nutritional deficiency quotes from the FDA, way before the grain-free kibble craze. So he felt he saw an extremely large number of dogs that were fed lamb and rice that developed DCM. Now he was not a researcher, he was just pulling his data in his own practice. So here we are 20 years later with more things that are popping up about diet. Food for thought. So let's take a look at some hearts. Nobody minds the slightly graphic picture. So which heart is normal? So just take a look at this picture. You've got the heart on the left and the heart on the right. You can see a cross section of the heart on the right. Unfortunately, I don't have a cross section of the one on the left. So as you can speculate, the normal heart is on the left. The heart on the right is significantly dilated what this picture below shows how thin the wall of this heart has become and you can see how it's just not possible for it to efficiently pump blood around the body this is a slide this is what a heart echo looks like being done by a cardiologist we've got a cross section of the heart showing in this sort of view, the doctor would be measuring the internal diameter of the chambers, would be looking at how the valves are opening and closing, and with colored Doppler, you could see backflow of blood. Blood should only be flowing in one direction. Here, in this view, they are measuring what's called fractional shortening, the amount the heart can contract down to pump blood. Okay, let's move on. 
So a little bit about human genetics and DCM in particular. So researchers have found 20 to 50% of the cases in humans are inheritable. We have 30 autosomal genes that have been identified to date. Let's look at how that compares to Doberman DCM. Researchers today, the primary researcher is Dr. Mears. She has found that the disease has an autosomal dominant characteristic. So what does that mean? That means that if the individual carries only one copy of the gene, that it will express itself. She has identified two markers in Dobermans, and today we call them DCM1 and DCM2. Bear with me, I'm getting to boxers. I just want to explain a little bit. So boxer cardiomyopathy. We are primarily dealing with arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. Again, this is a disease of the electrical system of the heart not the structural or the pump mechanism. We do find it to be familial and we do find it to be autosomal dominant with a variable expression. So again, this means that the individual only has to carry one copy of the gene to have, to have boxer cardiomyopathy. Variable expression means that we can have incomplete gene penetrant, pen, penetrance. So why does one individual who has the gene show the disease and, and another does not? Unfortunately for boxers, a lot of times the first clinical sign is sudden death. In most cases, these dogs are asymptomatic. Boxer cardiomyopathy is primarily a disease of dysarrhythmia rather than a myocardial dysfunction, meaning the primary disease path for boxers is electrical in nature, not a pump mechanism. The good news is diagnosis is made with an ambulatory EKG or Holter, and in many cases an echo. So why is a Holter superior to a, to a in-clinic ECG? And that boils down to extended recording time. When you take a dog into your general veterinarian and they hook a dog up to in their EKG in-house, um, number one, the dog is typically held down on the table in lateral recumbency with the legs out in parallel for three to five minutes. And we're getting just a small sampling of that heart's rhythm within the day. With a Holter monitor, we are minimally recording the dog's ECG for a full 24 hours. Screening for Boxer DCM. On a Holter exam, I would routinely recommend an exam or a study once a year. On reports that have over 100 VPCs, and I'm going to show you that in a minute, what a VPC is and, and how we take a look at that, that would be considered abnormal. Reports that have periods of couplets, triplets, or runs of VTAC, that's all abnormal activity. So let's start here, a VPC or a PVC, they're all, it's the same thing, ventricular pre-contraction. Periods of couplets. Couplets are two VPCs in a row. A triplet is three VPCs in a row. And a run is, th is four or more. So let's take a look at this tracing right here. This is a normal beat. This is a normal beat. This is an abnormal beat or a VPC. 
So on this tracing, we have one VPC. I will tell you that the cardiologists, most cardiologists' opinion of a single VPC is that it's fairly benign. What they get very concerned about is when we have runs of VTAC or runs of VPC. So this is a normal tracing. This is a normal tracing. This is the heart misfiring repeatedly. So Boxer CM, they find that in hearts with of Boxers that have passed from ARVC, we have a fatty infiltrate of the myocard infiltrate of the myocardium, meaning more than normal fat deposits in the heart muscle. Sudden death is always a possibility. Some boxers may develop dysfunction and heart failure as we described in the previous slides. Many dogs live for years without any symptoms. So the genetics in humans with ARVC. In humans today, we know of at least eight autosomal genes that are identified. In boxers, right now we have one. And again, this is through research of Dr. Mears. And I know your um, boxer gene test came out before the Doberman gene test. Dr. Mears has not identified a second gene. Um, in Dobermans, we have. Just like with boxers, we found the first test to not be the answer to our very complicated problem. Um, with the advent of the second test, DCM2 and Dobermans, we are finding significance of the combination of those two gene tests. So there was recently a study done on Doberman's DCM gene one and DCM gene two. And they took those negative, negative dogs and they have been following them over time. Um, the second test came out about six years ago and the study thus far shows about an 85% success rate, meaning 85% of the negative, negative Dobermans to date have not developed DCM. And these dogs are being closely monitored with echoes and halters. So what does that mean? That means there is another gene. There's gonna be a, probably a DCM three and maybe a four and maybe more. Um, but 85% clear is a whole lot better than 50% clear. We're heading in the right direction. We need to support researchers. I realize that this first gene test has not been the answer, but Dr. Mears is looking at the dogs that she labeled negative to develop your next test. So we, we need to continue looking. We are not gonna find the answer if we don't support researchers and don't continue looking. So the halter monitor, particularly for the boxer, the halter monitor is the gold standard for evaluation of arrhythmia. Why? Because the, the halter monitor measures one aspect of the heart, and that is the electrical impulse of the heart. That is the only thing it records. It absolutely can help assess for sudden death. Why? Because sudden death occurs from runs of VTAC and atrial fibrillation. It has a low sensitivity for significant heart enlargement. It is not the tool to use to diagnose um, a dilated heart. We have better tools. We can, the gold standard for that would be an echo as you've learned. Um, you could also do a pro BNP test. We could also do an X-ray. There's a way for your general veterinarian to take a lateral X-ray of your dog's 
chest and do a what's called a vertebral heart score to measure heart size. That's not the vertebral heart score it is by far not the gold standard, but it is better than nothing if you do not have a cardiologist available with an ultrasound. The halter offers little usable data to determine severity of heart enlargement. And for us, halters are readily available in the US, Canada, and around the world. And with digital halters today, we literally have no international boundaries. All of the data is transmitted to Alba Medical online and reports are emailed to owners. So let's like take a look at haltering your dog. Health testing is important to long-term success of your breeding program. Longevity is everything. Breed type, structure, temperament, and health make up the total boxer. Dogs can be identified and started on meds before they drop from ARVC, and that would be through antiarrhythmic medications that are generic medications, fairly inexpensive, readily available. Once your dog is diagnosed with ARVC and medications are started, a halter is then used to measure response to medications and medications are uh, titrated to the patient depending upon a halter result. So once you have a dog that's diagnosed and on medications, a halter becomes your tool to measure um, how we're responding to medications and the disease process. Starting at two years of age, we recommend, most cardiologists recommend starting minimally every 12 months. I recommend every six months. When you own a halter, I, I don't think it does anybody any good if it's living in your closet or your drawer. We need to be putting these units on the dogs and using them. When you're starting a halter program in your breeding practice or your breeding program, I recommend you start with the birth month of each litter. So let's say you've got 10 litters that you all of a sudden have to test. So we don't have to do that all right away. If you've got a litter born in December, I would start with those dogs and I would notify all of the puppy parents and um, notify them that you're starting haltering and that you recommend two years of, of age or older. They can come back to you as, as distance permits and get those dogs hooked up um, and monitored and get those reports back. This also gives you more information about your breeding program. So even though dogs are not being shown and bred, you have companion dogs in every litter. Those dogs should still be tested. Um, those owners should still be given information about why we test and why it's a good idea so that they can extend the life expectancy of their companion. Finally, all breeding stocks should have current testing. Ideally within three to six months um, of the breeding. Uh, testing a dog or a bitch after the fact, I get these questions all the time, is a moot point. We need to be doing this testing before. Becoming a halter resource for all of your puppy parents. So let's look at halter screening. Halter screening at, is, can be done at home and is simple and pretty affordable. Um, I think we all spend a lot of money showing dogs. Um, I think we can put a small part of that in our uh, savings accounts and use that to test the dogs. So this picture here um, is of a dog wearing a halter vest. This is a vest made by dog legs and there is a belt. There is a monitor under the vest and there is a belt to help keep it closed. 
this is a picture of the same dog before and I have electrodes mounted on her left side and there are also more on the right side. Altering is as easy as AB, ABC, it really is. So units can be purchased by individual breeders or owners. Um, a lot of times a dog club in an area will go together or a group of breeders to share expenses. And I think that's a great way to go and everybody can learn together. Dogs are hooked up by their owners and monitored at home and I do have videos available. I do have pictures, step-by-step -step documents available. It's, uh, and we also recently shared a video of myself doing hookups. So I, I don't want people to not think that they can't master haltering. It, it, it absolutely can be done by everybody. Data, once it's collected, is simply transferred to Alba Medical via the internet. Internet is the super highway. It's tying all of us together from around the world. Reports are then, data is then processed and reports are emailed to the owners. Typically 48 to 72 hours, Alba Medical is open Monday through Friday. So for instance, if you transmit your data Sunday night and Monday morning, uh, we start processing data, you would typically have bought that by Wednesday or Thursday at the latest. We do have a cardiology interpretation available as a service that we offer from our cardiologists on staff for a small additional nominal fee. Um, OFA has an advanced cardiac database that includes echo and halter testing. So if you're not familiar with OFA's advanced cardiac database, it, that um, certification is available only through a boarded cardiologist. So the cardiologists are sent forms that OFA requires be filled out after a dog is echoed and has a presenting halter report. And the echo findings are then placed on this form. The cardiologist clears the dog, labels the dog normal, reads the halter report that you have brought, places an addendum, another form that's filled out, and together those are sent to OFA. And then OFA gives a certification, kind of like a SURF or an I certification to that dog for a year, stating that that dog has been tested and has normal results. I think that's a great tool to use for breeders and I recommend anybody who goes to the extent of doing echo and halter testing to take that extra step and um, send that information to OFA. So we're going to look at some reports. I want to show you how simple this can really be. So this is the first page of a report um, that came back on a dog and um, this owner okayed me sharing this information. So let's, let's look at the, the very top of the report. We're just going to go through the entire thing. So I have the patient's name, Reggie Hood. His date of birth was supplied by the owner. The ID Reg, that is what we put every, each halter monitor has a way for you to ID the patient. And I do want you to put something in there to identify the dog so that beyond a shadow of a doubt, you know that the report in front of you is from the halter test that you ran. And in this case, I put in the unit Reg as the ID of the patient. You could put a birthday in here. You could put a KC number or, or a, a registration number in here. Just something so that you can identify the patient. There are times that people are running multiple dogs at a time. And on some of the units, you can possibly um, confuse 
the SD card. So it's always a good idea to put that information in there. Uh, the patient's age and sex and breed. Over here, we have who we're sending the uh, report to. And then uh, the date recorded comes into play and time. Next paragraph. So it says here the patient was monitored for a full 24 hours. If you didn't have the unit on the dog for a full 24 hours, it would indicate that here. The total time analyzed on this dog was 23.40. So it's important to understand that just because you have the unit on the dog for a full 24 hours does not mean we get a total time analyzed of the same. So every time the dog moves, we get interference. And I'll show you that in a couple pages here. So it is very common for a dog to have a unit on for 24 hours, yet the total time analyzed is 18 hours or 19 hours or 20 hours. In this case, we almost got the full 24 hours. So that's great news. And that is something you want to pay attention to. If we get a data file in that has total time analyzed of less than 17 hours, we're gonna email the owner and ask you to repeat the study because by definition, a 24 hour halter report must have at least 17 hours of analyzed data time. It tells you when the report was started and how many beats and less than 1% were ventricular beats or VPCs. So then we have, you know, your mean heart rate, your maximum heart rate. This is all good information. The area that you are primarily concerned about when you're looking at a halter report is the ventricular ectopy or in boxers, supraventricular ectopy columns. And they're on the first page right here. This dog had a total of six VPCs. They were all singles. So we didn't have any pairs, we didn't have any runs on this report. So you see down here in the comments, VPC summary, six singles, no pairs, no runs. So this report is normal and it does not need to be zero to be normal. In a Doberman, 50 to 100 VPCs is considered abnormal. And if you have a report that has over 50 to 100 or a report that has pairs, triplets, or runs, I would recommend that you request a cardiology consult. So most of the clients that are doing halters, they have us, they request service one. And that is where they get the report back and they take a look at it. Then they decide, do I need a cardiologist to interpret this for me? If they decide they would like that, you simply reply to the email that sent you the report. It's reports at albamedical.com and request a cardiology consult. And Dr. San Marco will take a look at that for you and send you recommendations. So let's look a little further at this report. So on the next page for Reggie, we have a breakdown per hour. So if you look over here, every hour we have a breakdown of a low, a high, a mean, the total number of beats, and then the VPCs. And if this dog had significant activity, there, all of these columns would have numbers. It also breaks down into time analyzed, how much time out of each hour was analyzed. So you'll see, typically it's very interesting. A lot of times we will see a lot of your arrhythmia occurring while a dog is sleeping. So you know, 10 a.m. to 7, 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. It's amazing how much uh, arrhythmia is occurring while they're sleeping. So this dog, it's interesting, at seven o'clock had five 
and then pretty much went through the rest of the 24 hours with nothing. So this is a very good example of you would never pick up these five on a three minute EKG. It's just not going to do. Very rarely is it going to happen. So uh, the rest of the report, we do samples of EKG and we tend to identify some of the arrhythmia during that. So we're looking at uh, the tracings of the halter. So every halter unit out there, no matter which one we're, which unit, which we're gonna go over that in a minute, we're looking at the units all record three tracings of ECG at a time. Okay, so you're looking at channel one, channel two, and channel three. Well, why is that? We're basically running spares. So we've got um, electrodes hooked up to the dog. If we were to a loose electrode or two, it's not, necessar it's not necessarily the end of the world and, and we don't have data. So um, that's important to understand about a unit. All right, let's look at that. Okay, so this is another report on a different dog. It, it is a Doberman, but you know, Dobermans have arrhythmia just like boxers. So let's take, let's take a look at this. So this patient was monitored for the full 24 hours. Again, we have real good um, analyzed time, almost the full 24 hours, that's awesome. We have a start time total number of beats, ventricular beats. We've got basic heart information here. So let's look here. Ventricular ectopy or VPC or PVC. Again, same thing. We have a total of 433 abnormal beats. 415 of them are singles, meaning one at a time. We have nine pairs or 18 of them were a double. You know, we had normal beats, two abnormal, and then back to normal sinus rhythm. We did have 11 runs of VTAC. The longest run had six beats in it, and the fastest run had five. And we do normally give the heart rate at that time. So in your comment sections below, we had 415 singles, nine pairs, and zero runs. So by definition, this dog has 433 VPCs well above um, the 100 count. So if this was your report, you would, you would take a look at this over a hundred, you would send it to a cardiologist for interpretation. Now, I will tell you this dog is a heart patient because oops, in the field for medication, the owner has put on sodalol, maxillotine, thyroid, benazepril, pemovendin. So this dog is having a significant arrhythmia problem. And I know that because this dog is on both sodalol and mexilatine. So cardiologists, they never take medications away. They only add them. So if we had an, an app, so I suspect this dog started with far more than uh, 433 and had far more runs than 11 and far longer runs than six. So this dog is fairly well regulated on the antiarrhythmics. So typically cardiologists will start one or the other antiarrhythmic. A lot of times the cardiologists will choose Sotolol first because it's a twice a day medication and owners have an easier time giving a medication BID or twice a day versus mexilatine, which is three times a day. So if a patient regulates well on one antiarrhythmic 
then we're going to stick with that until such a point where the heart is no longer controlled and then we add the other antiarrhythmic. So, uh, so the combination of the two tells me this, this dog has had a significant problem and I know 433 is abnormal, but I see reports with thousands, 10,000, 20,000 um, abnormal heartbeats. So 433, this dog's well controlled with this medication. Uh, Benazepril is your vasodilator that we talked about, and Pemobendin is uh, the vet medin product. That is the medication used to help the pump, the heart uh, pump more efficiently. Okay, so here's the second page of that report. And you will see um, we're looking in the evening in particular. There's a whole lot of arrhythmia going on at night when this dog is sleeping. Breaks it down into pairs, VTAC, and just all of your information. Now you'll see with this dog, um, again, our hookup was really good. I mean, this dog literally got a full hour on every hour, which is great news. Same report, we're just looking at various tracings um, throughout the report. We give you examples. Um, if you're, typically when we send an owner the report, it's a summary, we give you some of the heartbeats recorded. If your veterinarian or if your cardiologist would like what's called a full disclosure report, meaning we print out every, we include every heartbeat, we can absolutely do, absolutely do that. You just send us a little note when you're sending in your data and request full disclosure. There's no additional charge for that. We can absolutely provide that information. So let's look at this uh, report. So I want everybody to take a look at this, read the whole thing, and I want you to think about if I got this report back, would I consider this report normal or abnormal? So on this study, uh, the unit was on the dog 20 hours. So for some reason, the owner took off this unit prematurely. Uh, maybe for some reason or another, um, the owner had to go to work and couldn't be with the dog for a full 24 hours, um, had some complication with the vest. Um, for some reason, we are lacking four hours. That's okay. Again, I would like you to have the units on the dog a full 24 hours. Um, but there are times where we have to take them off prematurely. Of that 20 hours, we got 19 hours or almost 20. So excellent hookup, excellent contact, um, great information obtained by that data. Again, we have all of our heart rates here. Here's our ventricular ectopy column. And as you can see, the total on this report was 4,600 VPCs. Um, most of them are singles, 3,800 of them are singles. 316 are pairs, meaning two in a row. There were 27 runs. And unfortunately, 257 beats were in the runs. The longest run had 54 beats and look at the heart rate. The fastest run had 19 beats and the heart rate. So um, through this presentation, I think all of you can see that there is no doubt that this report is abnormal and we should be sending this report to a cardiologist for interpretation and due to these runs, this dog absolutely should be on an antiarrhythmic. So down here, you've got your uh, summary of pairs, triplets, and runs. Let's go back real quick. I forgot to mention superventricular ectopy. 
This is not a column we really look at in Dobermans, but it is a column we need to look at in boxers. So supraventricular means it originates above the ventricles in the AV node or the atria. So this is a column we are gonna look at in boxers. The next page of that prior patient, again, breakout in regards to um, per hour. You can kind of go through here and you can just see how this heart is absolutely struggling and the number of VPCs um, per hour. Uh, if we look at nighttime, this dog is fairly consistent during the day and at night. We did have some periods of time early morning where it was lower. Um, at noon, this is probably um, when the dog was very possibly active outside. Um, we do got pairs and uh, your runs of VTAP. Again, this is samples of ECG on that same patient. And you can just see that the runs of VTAC here, it's, it's very obvious. Okay, this report. This report, I will tell you, um, was placed on a dog, again, a Doberman. Um, but again, Dobermans have arrhythmia just like boxers. So unfortunately, this dog died while wearing the halter. Um, the owner was doing a screening and just by chance happened to draw, to record um, that fatal event. So we're gonna take a look at this. So the dog was monitored for, unit was on the dog a full 24 hours. You can see time analyzed. This is more typical of what we typically see. We never get that full 24 hours. This dog had almost 19 hours, which is acceptable. Again, if it's less than 17, we're gonna contact you and recommend that you redo that. All of your basic heart rate information here. Here's your ventricular ectopy, 833, 719 single, 11 pair, six runs. Also on this dog, we do have supraventricular ectopy. 478 total, 474 single, two pairs. I would treat this column in a boxer just like you would this column. If there are more than 100, I would recommend sending that in for interpretation. You can see in the com, oops, sorry. You can see in the comments, um, the ventricular ectopy was noted. Also the supraventricular ectopies and that the pa patient passed away while wearing the halter. So the patient had ventricular uh, bigamy, which means we go from normal beats to abnormal beats back to normal beats, followed by a rapid rate of VTAC which progressed to ventricular fibrillation. So I'm gonna show you that in this report. So again, this report breaks it down per hour. This is always the second page. You can see here, she actually really got almost a full hour of data on every hour, except for when we had that fatal event out in the yard. Again, we're showing um, samples of channel one, channel two, and channel three. So I go, see everything's running fairly normally here. This is just prior to the VTAC, VFIN. We get to here, these are VPCs. VPC, VPC, right here is where we start that heart in VTAC. 
once the heart enters into that stage, you can see how disorganized that becomes. And the heart is absolutely struggling to maintain function. And we just have a down roll, downhill spiral to the end, which is sudden death. All right, let's talk about the units. So um, we have digital units available today. I'll just back up and say we all, the Halter movement started with cassette units, uh, what we call the CR-160. And that was literally a ECG Halter that recorded everything to a tape, a, literally a tape deck and recorded to a tape and the tapes were mailed to Alba Medical. The problem, of course, with mailing is tapes would get lost, they took a long time to get in, they take time to process, and then reports return to you. So as of the end of this year, uh, we are no longer processing uh, tape decks. Why is that? The computer system that's used to process the tape decks um, requires Windows 97. And as we all know, that is no longer supported. So as of the end of the year, um, Alba Medical will no longer be able to process the old tape decks. And we've been moving um, to help those clients integrate to the digital units of today. And, the beautiful thing about Alba Medical is that we assist clients with upgrades and we do have trade-in programs, trade-up programs available to help you um, we, where we literally give you a credit for an old unit to help you upgrade to a new unit. So the DR200 is a second generation digital monitor. This is the monitor right here. It's about the size of a flip phone and it records data to an SD card and uses one battery. And it has um, a wiring harness that can either have five or seven electrodes. Um, for the most part, we standardly send our uh, breeder clients, uh, owner clients, five electrodes. Sometimes our cardiologists would prefer seven. So just so you understand the difference between five and seven is with five, some of these electrodes are doing double duty, meaning they are communicating in two channels. Because remember your halter report has three channels or three tracings of ECG. So some of these electrodes are doing double duty. On a seven lead system for the DR200, none of the electrodes are doing double duty. They all work independently and they're communicating to an electrode. You know, an electrode from the left is communicating to one wire on the right and you don't have any double duty. So if you were to lose an electrode, you're only going to lose one channel versus possibly two. So this dog on the table here is wearing the DR200 and just uh, demoing the electrode placement. So we have do what I call Doberman colors on the left. We did, uh, we did make sure that in regards to electrode mounting, we were mounting less electrodes for those that shave on the left or show side and more electrodes on the right. Um, I have Christmas colors or Italian colors on the right. So here's the left side of the dog, the right side of the dog. When we mount the electrodes, I do wanna make sure to give plenty of clearance to this elbow. Um, I'm very much an advocate of halter placement being comfortable for the dog. So I do not like to see electrodes mounted in the elbows. I do want this elbow to have clearance. 
Uh, the dogs do, do need to wear this for 24 hours. I myself have worn halters, um, and I know that I would not want them in my armpit. Um, they are fairly comfortable, but they are noticeable. So we, we do everything possible to make this comfortable for the dog. So in regards to shaving, that's a, a common question asked. So as you can see, this dog is not shaved. Um, I would say about 50% of our clients with Alba Medical do not shave. I have hooked up lots of dogs, uh, particularly at the National, that are being shown that are not shaved. Um, the act of shaving only helps with contact to skin. So the adhesiveness of this pad, right now it's mainly adhered to hair, not to skin. It also can help with um, our tracing, the strength of signal on our tracing. So on these digital units, the thing I love about digital is that the units have the ability to check your hookup or strength of signal before you start this study and send this dog on a 24 hour haltering mission. So in the old days with the cassette units, you had no way of knowing if you were even getting recordable data. We literally hooked up that dog, prayed it worked, sent it in, and hopefully we got a report. And in most cases, in most situations, it did work but there are situations where it may not work. So for instance, if this dog was a senior dog, um, a lot of times I have noticed is that senior dogs get mo more coat and they get a thicker coat as they age. So a lot of times I notice when I'm working with an older dog, I need to shave a little bit because when I hook up these electrodes and start my unit, uh, the unit tells me the strength of signal is poor. So um, in my videos, when we start up this unit, it shows you the three tracings of ECG on the screen, and it gives you a, a number on the left-hand side from zero to five. And I like to three, see a three or more on all three channels before I start this study. If I have less than a three or zero, then I'm going to be looking at what's causing um, my lack of signal. The first thing I would do is take off these electrodes, shave the dog lightly with a clipper. You don't have to use a 40 blade to go down to the skin. You take, if you have an adjustable clipper and take a 20, just to take off, uh, the guard hairs and get to the peach fuzz, that is typically more than enough to get what you need. So remount these electrodes, restart this unit, and in most situations, that corrects my problem. The other unit available is uh, the new patch style DR400. So this unit, as you can see, is significantly smaller. It's about the size of a key fob. It does not have wires. Um, this unit first launched uh, last year at the National, late 2019. And um, the first version of the unit, we were using one red wire. You may see some videos, including my current hookup video that shows one red wire. Well, we have come up with a way to use this unit with no wire. And version B that's coming out, due to come out any time, um, no red wire. So this same dog is hooked up with the DR400 patch style unit. And as you can see, there are three electrodes on the left side only, none on the right. This unit features a Bluetooth dongle that you need to use with your computer. And the computer cannot be a Mac, unfortunately. It must be a Windows-driven PC. And there is a utility that's placed on your computer. With the Bluetooth dongle, the DR400 transmits the data 
to your computer only so you can view the strength of signal, just like on the DR200. But the advent of the 400 is that you can check your hookup throughout the study. So in the beginning and throughout the entire study. Now, I don't necessarily run it all day. I'll just check it periodically. Um, but it is amazing to see that technology available. So I want to point out that the DR400 has an internal memory source. When you're using the Bluetooth dongle on your computer, the DR400 is storing the data within the unit. It is not storing the data to your computer. But um, this unit, both units, you need a vest to cover the dog. I do like using the belts. Um, for the DR400, I really like using two belts. One belt comes directly over the unit and these electrodes, and the second belt comes up this way. I, I really find that the belts help keep things snug and attached. So how do you get started with haltering? Um, if you have a question, if you want to order, feel free to give me an, send me an email. This is my email address. Um, we are currently running a special. If you purchase a unit, you can either receive a free halter vest, or if you have a vest or would like to have one handmade, you're welcome to sign up for five free scans. And that applies to both the 200 and the three-year warranty or the 400 with the three-year warranty. And that is my presentation. All right, thank you so much, Don. Uh, that was, uh, you know, I think you need a couple. Uh, you've been speaking continuously for the last uh, 90 minutes. <laughs> Oh, 90 minutes? Are you kidding? <laughs> well, I told uh, you it would take more than an hour. I'm sorry. Right. No, 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 no not at all. I, I, I think uh, I, I know that this session was uh, initially put together for the benefit of uh, veterinarians, too. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I know that a lot of content that was covered here um, had a lot of depth, a lot of information. And uh, and for those ones that are watching this or are watching this podcast or which who missed out on the session, the earlier parts of the session, this is going to be available on YouTube as well as a permanent record. So you could go back and uh, watch portions of it or all of it as you see fit. Uh, now, Don, I had about 35 questions in store, but uh, I think you answered about uh, 20 of them. So I have a few questions left. Uh, now, for those ones that are watching uh, and for those that have questions, please uh, do put them in the comments and I will ask uh, Don those questions. Uh, <coughs> sorry. Um, so, Don, I actually wanted to ask, I have some questions from your session. And, uh, and to start this with, to start this question session, I wanted to actually ask you what measures uh, can to enhance uh, cardiac health in dogs. So can you repeat that? I'm sorry, it cut out. Yeah, no problem, yeah. So I, I know that preventative measures are always better than, um, you know, you know I, I know breeding practices play a major role in making sure that you, you know, you breed a, a negative dog with a negative dog or a clear dog with a clear dog. Uh, but being, um, you know, once you have read that, what are some of the measures that you take as a responsible owner of a dog to make sure that it is in peak cardiac health? So with cardiac testing, we need to do more than one test. So every time we test a dog, it is a picture in time of the cardiac function of the dog. So with boxers, I would be haltering and haltering regularly. I mean, if you have a unit available, I think every six months is very uh, important. 
And let's identify, let's find that problem early on. And number one, we remove that dog from breeding practices. I know that's hard to hear, but affected individuals, once it's known, should not be bred. We get that dog on medication to extend life expectancy. So that is how I feel at this point in time we move forward until such a time that we have genetic testing available to help us identify individuals before they present the problem. Got it. Thank you. Uh, so so Don, I actually wanted to ask you this. Um, now, I know you mentioned a lot of um, the medical terms, and I'm sure I'm going to get them wrong if I try to repeat them. Uh, but okay. okay, so let's say, <clears throat> let's say um, a heart, a, a dog fails a test. Mm -hmm. um, how uh, how quickly or how soon? should you actually take that test again? Like for example, if the dog fails a test, you know, it, making a hard line decision about cutting the dog from the breeding program might, might be actually uh, my position like you stated, but how soon or how quickly could you actually do that test again? Uh, and I have a second part to that question. Uh, my second part of that question is, what are some variables that may cause a heart healthy dog to fail a hold to test? Yeah, and I think those are very valid questions. So I do not want us eliminating dogs from gene pools prematurely. So I do think it's important if we have a dog that tests abnormal, that we repeat the test. We need to analyze Number one, if there's something going on in the environment that may have caused arrhythmia, there are other causes to arrhythmia other than heart disease. So for instance, a dog that has a bad halter, we take a look at it and may have recently had gastrointestinal issues, vomiting, diarrhea, um, a health issue. We should be monitoring dogs that are healthy and normal and have a normal um, health status, not a dog that's having any medical issues. I will also tell you that cardiologists inform me that certain medications can cause arrhythmia from antibiotics to antidiarrheals. So we want to make sure that a dog is not on medications and those medications have cleared the system. So I think that's important. I do not, you know, our gene pools are so closed and so small and our genetic diversity is already so limited that we need to look at the full perspective, the entire picture um, before removing dogs from gene pools. I absolutely agree with you. Okay. Thank you, Don. So if, if uh, I had an informal report, I would probably analyze the situation. First of all, I wouldn't be testing a dog that's having any sort of health concern or on medications. Um, make sure medications are cleared from the system. I may go out two, three weeks, maybe even a month, and then test the dog. If I get an abnormal report, I'm going to repeat that report typically within two to four weeks to see if I can repeat that data. If it's the same or worse, then I'm sending both reports to a cardiologist for interpretation. Okay. Uh, my, my next question again is based on what you just stated. You know, you said our gene pool is very limited. Now, if, yeah. we take, if, we, if we took a step back and saw why that is, uh, and readers, uh, we strongly advocate tight line breeding, inbreeding practices. Uh, so my question is, would you state that to be one of the major contributors of uh, you know, cardiomyopathy? 
Now, as a breeder yourself, breeding Dobermans, um, do you think that we have we have actually gone into an area uh, which is uh, which has put us at a disadvantage because of the, the breeding process that we have gone into? So, Kate Mears, Dr. Mears, the researcher that's doing a lot of this genetic um, data collection, feels that in both Dobermans and Boxers, that it's an autosomal dominant trait, which means the individual only has to carry one copy of the allele to be affected by the disease. So, whether you're inbreeding, line breeding, outbreeding, you only need one copy of that of that gene to have an individual that may very well become affected with the disease. So I have always been one to breed for type and not necessarily tightly inbreed dogs. And because of that, most of my dogs have a, uh, a, a, uh, what do we call COE, a coefficient inbreeding factor that's fairly low. And um, Embrace is a company that does that sort of genetic mapping. Um, in Dobermans, it's called the Doberman Diversity Project, but they work with Embrace. And Embrace is doing all of that information. So it's possible for you to send a DNA sample to embrace and find out what your inbreeding coefficient factor is. And they promote or advocate diversifying the gene pool by lessening that factor. They want to see it under 25%. And there certainly are a lot of dogs that have a uh, inbreeding coefficient factor that is much higher, 40 or 50%. And it makes sense that we diversify the genes and try to broaden that pool. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. I uh, didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, now, my, my next question, of course, um, I, I do have a few questions, but I'm going to take a question from a viewer, uh, Bobby Smith. Um, actually, I'm going to put that question up on the screen, um, John. Uh, so Bobby Smith states, are ARBC clear dogs the only dogs that are recommended to be used in a breeding program? Or is it okay to bring ARBC clear to an ARBC heterozygous dog? So we're talking about Kate Muir's uh, testing that's currently available in boxers. And the problem with, not the problem, but what we're running into is that she has labeled dogs clear that later develop ARBC. So why is that? Well, you saw on the slide for humans that we have, what, 30 genes that are responsible for this disease. So she's isolated one gene and only one gene. In Doberman, she has two. So she herself, when she gave a presentation at the Doberman National, um, she stated that there are more genes involved. So she also stated being very cautious about only breeding clear dogs because the heterozygous dogs that carry that gene may or may not develop ARVC due to incomplete gene penetrant, penetrance. So the answer to that is she is offering information so that we know what the status of that gene is. We feel she feels there are more. She hasn't identified those yet. And she doesn't want breeders to bottleneck the the dog gene pool so small because we're only breeding to clear dogs, we run a risk of the diversity of the gene pool by doing that. I mean, she was very clear in her presentation. Right, right. 
I've, I've got another one. Uh, thank you, Bobby. Uh, I've got another one from Bobby again. Now, I had intended on asking you this question, but thanks, Bobby, for praising it for me. Um, so what uh, Bobby says in this question is, uh, typically with the DM manifestations, uh, they say the dog, you know, you start testing the dog at two years, you know, not right. uh, but start at two years. Does that mean uh, at with a dog which is 12 months uh, or you know a year old, even though the dog is ready, uh, is too is it too young to do a baseline holder on the boxer? Um, that is being considered for a breeding program. If and if it's so, um, what do you recommend for hard testing prior to two years of age for boxes that are going to be used for in a breeding program? So I don't see any problem with holtering a dog before two years of age. I mean in in Dobermans, we recommend too. I start all my dogs at 18 months. I have seen dogs come into the heart clinic that are exhibiting signs or, or have an abnormal halter at 18 months of age. Um, so there, there is in Shiloh Shepherds, we are testing puppies. They have a form of arrhythmogenic heart disease where they have a juvenile onset of the disease. And these breeders are testing literally eight and 12 week old puppies. And if those puppies present with arrhythmia, they are not using those dogs in their gene, in their breeding programs. And what happens in that breed is it's a juvenile onset. They do see some puppies that develop sudden death, but a lot of them become adults and are carriers and they wanna identify them early on and not include them in breeding programs. So I don't see any problem with haltering boxers younger. If anything, it gives you a good baseline. You know where you're starting from. Makes sense, perfect. Um, I, I know that you are a member of, uh, you know, you should be a member of DPCA because you are a Doberman breeder, you are a judge. Uh, now. With regards to uh, Dobermans, I know that um, I saw one of the interviews where they mentioned about the LC uh, longevity certificate in Dobermans. Mm -hmm. um, how has that actually improved the life expectancy of Dobermans? You know, I believe it has. I mean, as a breeder, when I'm researching a stud dog, I like to see LC certification in the pedigrees. So, you know, a lot of times when I'm looking at a stud dog's pedigree, it helps me um, with that information very easily. So what happens with the program, it is, it is an owner, it is reliant on the owner sending the information to the DPCA. And basically when uh, I have a dog that reaches 10 years of age, I, send the DPCA longevity chair an email stating such and such a dog is now 10 years old. And then they go into the database and they register that dog as LC. L, it, typically like LC, the number 10 in L meaning living. Behind that dog may be other dogs that have LC certification. And when the dog passes, the owner contacts the DPCA or contacts the chair, tells them my dog passed away, is 12 years old, and then that dog would have an LC12D behind its name. So I know the dog is deceased and was 12 years old. If my dog has two parents that have LC certification, then my dog gets a um, some letters behind his name called BF for bred for longevity, BFL, uh -huh. and it might say BFL1, which means bred for longevity first generation. And if we get back further generations, like say the second generation where all four dogs, paternal, maternal, are bred for longevity, then it would be a BLF2. So that's the kind of certification that's come up through the DPCA to help people recognize longevity within a pedigree, which I think is important. 
Wonderful. Um, <clears throat> my, my next question is actually about, uh, you, know, you start testing the dog at when, he's, when he or she is at two, uh, and you continue doing that uh, every year thereon. Uh, but with the years of testing, could a dog ever be considered cardiac clear? You know, at this point in time, I say no, because an echo or a halter report is a picture in time. It does not forecast what it's going to be in six months or a year. It can very much change. And that's why with heart disease, we have to do serial testing. One test is not enough. And that is why the advanced cardiac database through OFA will only certify a dog for a year, just like the surf testing for eyes. Why is it it's only good for a year? Because the condition of the eye can change. And that is why with the advanced cardiac database, you have 12 months of certification and then you must retest. So unfortunately, that's the problem with heart disease. We don't have a crystal ball to say dog A and dog B are going to have DCM. I'm, I'm going to use dog C. You know, dog A and dog B can test absolutely fine. And on the day we are making rational decisions about health, temperament, and structure, unfortunately, the health can change over time. And, and that's why we're in this predicament. We, we don't know. Hmm. Um, this this is going to be a, a, a bit of a hypothetical question, Don. Uh, yes. I, I know that as uh, I, I know that every breed, you know, when they when they were actually recognized, uh, got written a standard, and um, for the guide for owners, they also had a defined life expectancy, expected life expectancy, right? Uh, now, with the with the situation that we are at right now, do you think we need to go back and reassess the life expectancy of a, of a breed? You know, I I feel today that we talk more about cardio and longevity than we did 10, 20 years ago. I think I feel ten even ten years ago. We kind of swept it under the carpet. We, a dog died and we moved forward. And today with the advent of the internet and everything that we have online and the communication that's available, the more we talk about it, the more people become accept, the more people accept that this is a breed problem and not a line problem. I can't say that enough. We, we can't blame the breeder down the street who bred stud dog A to five bitches and has DCM or, you know, cardio today and is producing litters of cardio. You know, nobody wants to breed an affected litter. I, I don't think any of us want to do that. You know, everybody, at least in our circles, we're all here because we're trying to preserve the breed for tomorrow. So that that is where we're at with this. None of us are intentionally doing that. So I, I feel we all need to take a step back and look at this as a breed problem, which it, it truly is, and move forward in a positive way to help preserve the breeds, our breeds for tomorrow. Got it. Um, I know that, you know, we talked about Dobermans, and of course, uh, we talked about, you know, which is a working group, uh, which is a working breed and so on. Uh, now, we also, see, and again, this is more specific to dogs, uh, which, uh, like, I'll, I'll take boxers, for example. I've never kept a Doberman, so I can't say that. Uh, but the, the box, some of the boxes, uh, the lazy dog syndrome, you know, they don't just want to, uh, you know, they feel lazy and they don't want to exercise. So now, my question is, yes, we're doing all this every year. You know, you're doing it every year. You test it, it's clear, but the dog is still 
uh, is still resistant to exercise. So uh, from a functional perspective, should exercise tolerance depth uh, for measuring respiratory function be conducted uh, periodically in between the whole test? I mean, I, I feel it is a visual way for an owner or a breeder to assess that. By no means can we use that as a diagnostic tool because the halter gives us solid information that's extremely visible, as you can see on those reports. Um, if I were, you know, of course, if, if I feel a dog is having exercise intolerance, that can absolutely be a sign of heart disease. It can absolutely be a sign of other diseases like issues with the back or the neck or, you know, all sorts of medical issues can come into play. So if you see a dog that has exercise intolerance that you are worried about, absolutely whip out your halter and put it on the dog. I, I think that's a, we need to be visually aware of the day to day signs that we see from our dogs. You know, monitoring resting respiration rate that I went over, that comes into play more for dogs that are having an issue with fluid or dilated cardiomyopathy. And that's where, as you saw in that earlier diagram, the fluid builds up in, in the lungs. And before the dog starts coughing, we will notice increased respiration rate. So if you're aware of that, you can catch that before the dog starts coughing and get the dog to the doctor and get the dog on medications. Because once the dogs reach congestive heart failure, it's like falling off a cliff. We, we want to catch them before that. The medications are much more effective. Okay. Perfect. Uh, John, I actually, uh, I, I, I think you are in a unique place um, because um, I think you are a breeder to start with. You are a judge, uh, and you assess livestock. Uh, you you choose uh, the breeding stock, or you help in the process of selecting the breeding stock. Uh, you are an exhibitor too. Uh, now, my question is more about getting your thoughts about, you know, should it be this way? Like, for example, should heart testing results be included at some level? Uh, in order for a dog to receive the highest honors? Mm -hmm. I guess personally, I would love to see that. I mean, when I'm a judge in the ring evaluating breeding stock, I don't have that information. And I am assessing confirmation quality, you know, breed type and temperament. Um, I don't know if AKC would ever or some of your other venues around the world um, would ever take that into consideration. Um, I don't know the logistics of making that all happen. It would it would certainly be an interesting item to include. Okay, we will leave that at that. And yes. uh, <laughs> uh, my my final question, Don, is you know you've, you've been thank you again. You've been very patient and uh, thanks for sparing the time. You know amongst your busy schedule. Uh, my final question is. What do you think, from an ethical breeding perspective, what do you think the breeder's responsibilities are when their stud dog or their brood bitch, uh, which cleared heart testing at an early age, fails the Holter test later in its life? So once we have confirmed that the individual has heart disease, so I wouldn't I would absolutely get a confirmation of that before I proceeded forward. I do feel it's important that we notify people with dogs in the pedigree of the condition. And I realize those are hard calls to make. I myself have made those calls. Um, I try very early on educating puppy parents about heart disease and how I want them to proceed. And, you know, two years of age, all of my puppy people, whether they the dogs are being shown bred or not, 
I want them being echoed and haltered. And I, I emphasize that very um, strategically. I put that in a contract. I can't make people test their dogs, but I don't want to hear I didn't know from any of my owners. So as a stud dog owner, if I have a dog that fails the grade, I have to pick up the, the phone and let the people know that have used him that we now have a problem. And in hopes that the people that hadn't made the effort to test now will. And sometimes people need that wake up call to do that. And again, as a preservation breeder, we have to educate people. We have to give them that opportunity. We have to give them the knowledge. And again, this is not a line problem. This is a breed problem. And I feel that if nothing else, we can embrace that fact. Nobody's responsible. You know, when a breed has a 50% problem, I'm not causing that heart disease. It is within the breed. Right. I hope someday we can find a genetic workaround so that all of us have a test we can go to to work around this. I do feel that when that does come, and someday I do think it will, we're going to have few individuals that are clear. Okay. I think uh, that's very aptly said. And... Uh, Again, you uh, you don't want to perpetuate the problem. If it's there, don't make it bigger. Don't make it worse. Uh, on that note, Don, I want to actually thank you again for uh, spreading time uh, to share your knowledge uh, and uh, context or content about the heart and poultry testing. Uh, any parting thoughts before we uh, end this interview, Don? No, I, I appreciate the opportunity to share the information and feel free to reach out to me. I am here to answer questions. I Again, I'm not a cardiologist nor a veterinarian. I do help people learn how to analyze their reports. And um, I am here as a resource to you with the advent of the Internet. doesn't matter where you are in the world. I am here to help. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in, and thank you, Don, again. Uh, have you have yourself a wonderful day. Thank you again, and we will meet you again in another interview uh, next. All right. All right. Have a good one. Bye bye.